Thank you. All right. Give respect to the comments and give you the time to entertain us. Okay, thank you. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Kobus Teron. I work for the Endangered Wildlife Trust in the Southern Drakensberg. And I want to talk a bit more about um, perceptions that farmers have. We often look at stewardship as, as such an awesome tool, and we just sit in meetings and we design plans, and we walk out and we're really chuffed with what we design. But seldom in those meetings do we actually, or when we think about stewardship, do we actually think about what, what will the landowner think about what we're discussing? Because it's great from a conservation perspective, but you know, how do people on the ground, our clients, in a sense, how do they feel about the stuff that we talk about? So, just you know, most of the people in, in, in this uh, like symposium started with the definitions of certain things. So, just perceptions, right? It's making sense of our external inputs, and from that, you know, it, th that's also influenced about how we experience things, where we were educated, what our backgrounds were. And perceptions change the, or influence the way you see the world, and ultimately it influences your behavior. Right? So, you know, just again, how do farmers perceive stewardship and conservation? And how do farmers perceive you? And what are your perceptions about farmers? Because we all have preconceived ideas um, about these things. And I, these questions, you know, people in stewardship, I think, need to have these questions in their mind the whole time. You know, when, when I rock up at a farm, how does the farmer see me? And how is the way I behave influence the stewardship process and all of these things? So it's tricky stuff. Um, just to tell you a bit more about my project, I basically work in a triangle between Matati Hill, um, Kokstad and Underberg, and the aim is to secure uh, s sites uh, uh, to the benefit of wattle crane and grey crown crane um, through the stewardship process. I'm currently working with about 40 landowners. Um, one of the challenges I find is because birds move around, um, that you know, I, I can't really work with willing landowners. I also have to work with unwilling landowners because cranes sometimes occur on unwilling landowners' property, and they love actually they love unwilling landowners. <laughs> <laughs> Most, so, so um, and so so for me really to make headways, I really need to understand how they're perceiving stewardship, so that I can influence them in you know in terms of, of convincing them to get on board and all of that. That's just some of our partners. One of the partners that's not in the picture is Crew and Isabel and I will be working on one site together. But because I'm working between two provinces, it's also quite nice because I'll have different experiences with authorities. Um, yeah. So um, the way that I kind of gathered my information is I gave out some questionnaires to the farmers that I worked with. Um, questionnaires are a funny thing because the more you, you get results back, the more you think, I should have asked them this, and I should have asked them that. And, you know, you can go through the questionnaires a hundred times beforehand, but you only see the issues when you start running through them. A lot of it's just personal observations. As I said, I'm aware when I go to farms, what is the guy thinking of me? How does he behave? You know, how does my words influence the way he reacts or don't react? Um, and then also I've come up with some recommendations. And just a disclaimer, the little star, is this is just for my area. So I can't say that this will be the same for your farmers in your area, right? But So we'll just go through some of those things. Um, so I just want to take you through some of the things that farmers have said to me. Because I think that's important, right? So a positive, on a positive note, right? For 50 years we have derived a living from this land. And now we want to give something back. And these are elderly farmers in the Franklin district, and they actually asked me, is it possible to rehabilitate their whole farm? And I said, well, I don't know. It's possible, but it's going to be costly. So it's quite nice. We also have that. Um, I've told them that they are not welcome on my property. Okay, this is referring to government conservation agencies. So it's problematic. Uh, in a sense, it's also a blessing because I'm still able to go to those properties in some of them. EWT also had had issues in some of the areas. Um, another farmer, I grew up here, and I want to make sure that when this farm goes to somebody else, that that person will not change things in the farm. Okay. Um, I've had a bad past run in with you people. I'd rather not get involved. It's hectic. And then you've got the worst kind is 
come on my property, monitor the cranes, do your thing, but it stops there. I don't want to know anything else. You can come anytime you want to, you can do whatever you want to, but don't talk to me about stewardship. In fact, don't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is it that keeps... I think it's important to think about what farmers... what occupies their thought process, because there are things that, that influences the way we interact with them, right? So, labor issues, okay, um, production issues, weather, uh, poaching, electricity costs and input costs, farm security, infrastructure, whether the milk truck can actually get to my farm or not, uh, land tenure, big uncertainties, and those uncertainties, they permeate into the stewardship process. Um, uh, water, right, uh, also very important. BEE, -E, uh, you can't build a dam nowadays without showing how you are involved. It will, you know, you need to show BEE -E kind of certification process. Predators, as we all know, um, somewhere in there, maybe there's a little space for stewardship and conservation. And then another thing that I've just recently learned quite hard is neighbors. Just because they're neighbors, don't mean they like one another. Okay. <laughs> So, another important thing is farmers are not a uniform group. We, we like to stereotype farmers, and it's this farmer and it's that farmer, but when you get to know the guys, they are all different. In fact, the only thing that they share is that they each want to do their own thing, and they don't want to be told by anybody how to do that thing. Okay, that's the only commonality that they have. And the reason for that is that um, commercial far you have commercial farmers, you have retired farmers, you have lifestyle farmers, and you've got plotters, you know, kind of people who think they are some, something in between all of those things. <laughs> <laughs> Generally also problematic. Um, um, and then, just to go into the questionnaire and some of the farmers' perceptions, um, I asked farmers if they had an understanding of the biodiversity assets and environmental services on their farms, and you can see most of them, and I didn't put percentages because my, you know, to, 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 these are based on about 20 returns, I don't want to get, you know, it would be unethical, I think, to put percentages and you will create the wrong perception, but you can see the majority of the farmers think they know, remember, this is not, they do know, this is, they think they know, okay, which could be true or which could be, you know, not true. Um, so that's quite interesting, so there's quite a nice awareness. Um, I'm currently implementing conservation practices on my farm. 75% of the farmers, their perception is that they are doing this. Okay? Uh, I put a question mark there because when I go onto the ground and I see new grasslands ripped up and new areas into wetlands, it, it worries me that these oaks are thinking that they're doing the right thing, but perhaps they're not. Um, obviously, it doesn't apply across the board, but again, some of my most enthusiastic stewardship people who are not uneducated, are guilty of some of these things, where, where they do bad things. Motivation for undertaking conservation practices on my farm, to a large extent it's personal. It's a personal motivation. That person has some kind of connection with the land and he feels responsible or not. Part of that personal, which is not reflected here, is the legacy component. So the person thinks, well, when I leave here, I don't want to leave a mess. So that's why they think they're involved. Also, quite interesting is for ecosystem services or to enhance ecosystem services, aesthetic value and future use values would be tourism or something that they've, a new direction for their farm that they've not at this stage clarified. A lot of that future use is actually tourism related kind of stuff. Um, then, my interaction with government conservation agencies. Um, either it's constructive or there's been no interaction, which is almost 80% of the people, they've had no interaction from government. Um, and then a uh, small percentage has been filled with conflict. Okay. Um, will conservation, government conservation agencies make a difference to my farm if they get involved? A percentage said yes, um, uh, uh, and then 55% so wrote right about yes or unsure, the rest say no ways. It's not gonna make any difference. The interesting thing is that farmers actually have the details. A large portion of the farmers have the contact details for government agencies, so it's it's actually they that are not engaging government because they've got they know where to find DCOs and and other government officials. Um, when it comes to conservation activities, I would like to work with, and you can see there's a big 
<laughs> so, so not one of the returns gave government or government conservation agencies as the option. And that's across two provinces. Okay? And in fact, we have been, and, and this is not a reflection on, on the government people in the, in the room, but we've been at meetings where people have told me in the meeting, I'm not signing nothing with government. Forget it. There's no ways. So, you know, one has to overcome that kind of thing. Then I asked farmers to prioritize the environmental issues on their farm. And after I kind of ranked them, these are the ranks that come out. So it's clearing of alien plants, erosion control, wetland rehabilitation, access to scientific information. This is not extension services. This is access to information. Farm labor education, predator solutions, improved security, which I find it strange. I thought it would be high up the list. Um, extension services marketing of, of their products in a green kind of way, and then renewable energy. The interesting thing, and I wonder if somebody can pick up on this, what, what's strange about the prioritization of it, if we think there's something, uh, yeah, there's something odd. Anyway, I'll tell you. Uh, the first three things relate to environmental goods and services. Okay. We're talking biodiversity stewardship to people, the audience is not interested in that. They're interested in the environmental ecosystem services and goods because that is related to their farming practice and that's how they make their money. So, you know, maybe we need to, I mean, I don't know, I don't have the solution, but maybe we need to factor that in seriously because, you know, if we, probably if we look after these things, I mean, the biodiversity will be protected to, to a large extent. But um, that's what their language, that's what they're interested in. So just some observations. Species like cranes are great icebreakers. So if you've got problems with farmers or you have access issues, try to find a, a flagship species because a lot of them relate to that. I've not been denied access to one farm, even where the oaks are bebluxent, okay? <laughs> because of the cranes, okay? They allow me onto the property and we've got a, 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 a foothold onto the property. There's a lot of work to be done, but it's awesome. Um, Landowners are tired of us saying, stop plying that, stop doing this, stop doing that. They want to know what is a constructive engagement. And you can't always constructively engage, but we need to work on that message that it's, you know, when they see you, they're actually happy to see you, or, you know, at least don't. <laughs> no, I don't know. Anyway, um, farmers in my area don't want to be called landowners, okay? Because they're farmers, they supply food, and they look after people. Um, Currently, the incentives we have are not game changers. In other words, you cannot go to an unwilling guy and say, look at the incentives, and he says, wow, I'm going to change my mind. Okay, it doesn't happen. It's, he's not interested. In fact, many of the guys I deal with, especially the wealthy guys, they say, well, who cares? You know? I mean, just for example, um, I know of one landowner that owns uh, about 500 hectares near the Loteni, and, and, and the rates, if that, that area is perfect for a nature uh, reserve status, but the rates is 51 rand a month. Okay, so if you now get a rates rebate, I mean... <laughs> okay, so farmers don't like questionnaires and paperwork, and that's why well, only half of the farmers return my questionnaire. And I try to overcome this by sitting with them and working through the questionnaire. That went down even worse. So don't, don't do that. Um, farmers are very skeptical of government involvement. I, I don't know why. Maybe it's the land tenure thing. Maybe it's macro conditions within the country that affects the stewardship process. But it's, this is a huge hurdle for me because it, it, it's, you know, at, the, at some point in time, we, I mean, KZ and Wildlife is our partner. So we want to, you know, we want to bring the partner in. And many of the landowners are saying, we don't want that partner. It's not only KZ and Wildlife, it's Eastern Cape, Parks Board. People don't want to, a lot of farmers don't want to engage. And then one question that bothers me quite a lot is, what will the ultimate biodiversity impact be if we only work with willing landowners? Because as I showed you with my cranes, we'll be missing out on you know, where all the cranes stay, on, on the Bibliks and the Oaks properties. <laughs> so just some of my recommendations. Um, you need to understand each farmer's motivations and interests because different things make them, different people tick. And some incentives, you know, like uh, one farmer, all he's interested in is, is for me to bring interesting people to his farm. That's the ultimate incentive. <laughs> because he's lonely or bored. I don't know what his problem is, but that's, for him, that's the most important thing. Um, 
we need to develop a value proposition or a unique stewardship value proposition. So each site has to have a different approach, different incentives or, 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 or avenues for incentives must be in, uh, um, explored. Keep it simple. I, I've, I've really tried to, I, I often make things complicated, but I've really tried to make things simple in terms of the stewardship. And in many cases, I see the guy's eyes just glaze over. They're just like, let's just get through this, you know, different categories and thing. I don't want to know, you know, I'm interested, but this is, sounds like work. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, establish in my area, if as many farmers, I can't go to them and say, uh, uh, let's do stewardship. I'm actually drinking tea, we're driving around in 4x4s, four we're having a good time, and I'm keeping quiet about the stewardship because I first want these guys to understand that, you know, they need to trust me. You know, another thing that's been, uh, no, that might be difficult, another thing that, uh, that uh, a lot of uh, organizations say, well, you know, the turnover of staff is a problem, we can't maintain relationships, when the staff member leaves, everything falls apart, blah, blah, blah. The question I want to ask is, how many NGOs have planned for that eventuality? How many stewardship facilitators that are here, that are on contract, will get a completion bonus at the end of their job? Nobody, probably. And the fact is, it takes a South African 18 months to get a job. Okay? So that means, like, I'm, I'm, I'm not even eight months into my project, I should already start job hunting. It's problematic. Uh, not that I am, but I'm just saying. <laughs> okay. So, um, if we want something from farmers, I really think we also need to bring something to the table, even if it's a token, you know, because I'm asking you for a huge commitment, but I'm saying, you know, like, and you do this, and you do this, and then later on we will do that. I, I think I don't like that approach. I like to bring something, even if it's, if it's booklets, if it's information, if it's something small, bottle of wine, I don't know. Um, and then we must acknowledge farmers when they do something good, because press... In the press, farmers are seen as a negative entity in general. So we need to work at, at, on that. Um, we need to talk about the message of gain. Because a lot of that stuff is being lost at a very rapid rate. And if you go down that avenue, the oaks just shut down. So rather than say, please don't plow near the wetland, we need to change our message to please let's you know, see how we can expand the wetland, how we can get more cranes into it, etc., etc. Um, regular contact. That's problematic. I'm working with 40 landowners. If I just had tea with them, that would be the only job. I'm struggling to have regular contact with them because I can't just have tea each day. So, so that's a problem. Um, and then what EWT has realized is that if we want to be involved in stewardship in that area that we are working in, it goes way, the commitment goes way beyond the CEPF grant in the three years. And we need to understand that, and we need to figure out how we're going to deal with that. Because if we don't, then, then there will be issues that arise. Absolutely. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, at least I'm glad I'm not working for government. <laughs> 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 Just for me, one minute for Thanks, Jeff. Just a couple of comments. Very interesting. I had a little bit of experience in the USA a few years ago, and the issues there are exactly the same as they are here. And, and for that reason, the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the various state provincial agencies, conservation agencies, do not do their equivalent, which is land trusts and conservation easements. They support NGOs and private people doing that. They're about probably now close to about 2,000 different land trusts in the state operating. For the exact reason is farmers there also do not want to deal with government and are interested. Um, but also, uh, yeah, um, I agree absolutely what you say, but also, uh, being 